Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. So inshallah, we're going to continue uh, with uh, salat. If, if you remember last time, we just barely started. We gave an introduction to salat. So we talked about the meanings of salat in language and in Islamic law. And then we talked a little bit about who are the people that are, uh, you know, obliged to pray. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about uh, who are the people who are supposed to make up the prayer if they missed it and who are not required to make it up if they miss it. A little bit about the obligation of the prayer. Uh, we know in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا That the prayer is uh, prescribed in particular times. In particular times. Now that means that you cannot pray before the time and you cannot pray after the time. For example, you cannot pray Asr before the time of Asr. Unless you're combining, but that's a different, that's an exception. And you cannot pray Asr after sunset. You gotta pray it in that time. Also, the prayer is the type of ibadah, of worship, where the time of the worship does not consume the whole time. If you look at fasting, for example, the whole time is consumed by the worship. You start from dawn all the way to sunset. When it comes to prayer, however, we say the time of Asr is from you know, late afternoon until sunset. We'll talk about the precise times later in another uh, class, lecture. But it doesn't mean that you're going to pray the whole time. You only take, what, five minutes? But you could have like two, three hours. But you only consume a small portion of that time. Now, what are the prayers that are required? We all know five prayers. And that's because there is a narration from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that says, خَمْسُ صَلَوَاتٍ كَتَبَهُنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ There are five prayers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written, has made obligatory on his, on his servants, on the people. So that means that there are no other prayer that is a must. Some people might say witr is you know, mandatory. Some other people might say Eid, Salat al-Eid is mandatory. But in this hadith, only the five daily prayers are an obligation, are a must. Everything else could be a highly recommended sunnah, could be fard kifaya, like it's a must, but on the group, not on the individuals, and so on. Only the five daily prayers are a must on each and every one of us. Okay. So today I want to talk about adhan. Adhan is like the beginning of the prayer. Now after you've made Tahara, we talked about Tahara for many sessions. Now, we're going to talk about the thing that will prompt you for Salat. The one that will make you ready for Salat. So today, inshallah, we'll dedicate the session to talk about Adhan. What is Adhan? What does it mean? If you look at the word Adhan, it's from Adhana or Adhina. And Udhan, Udhan is ear. And we know ear is the tool of hearing. The meaning of adhan in the language, it means to notify someone. To notify someone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned it in the Quran, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ When he talked about hajj, you make a call for hajj. Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is why we make hajj up till now. Because of the call of Ibrahim. So he made, not an adhan like we do for salat, but he made a call. It's a call. And this is why we call it adhan. Adhin finas bil hajj. What is the definition of adhan in Islamic law? It is al i'lam bi dukhul al waqt. It is to notify people about the beginning of the prayer time. That is the definition of adhan. So when I make adhan for dhuhr, that is a signal that the time of dhuhr has entered. And this is why you cannot make adhan before dhuhr. It's haram, because people think that dhuhr has entered. 
So it has to be a signal for the entry of time. That time has started. That now, from now on, you can pray. So that is a definition of Adhan. It is a signal, it is a notification of the beginning of time. That is Adhan. Uh, is Adhan mentioned in the Quran? That's a little quiz. Yes, you say. Where? No, we just mentioned that. No, Adhan for prayer, not for Hajj. Anyone? In Surah Al-Jumu'ah, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ It didn't say Adhan, so it's a trick question, but has the same meaning. It says, if the call for Jumu'ah was made, Nudia. Nudia is from Nida, which is to yell or to, to make a call, to make a loud call. That is Nida. So that's another word for Adhan, a Nida. Nida is a call, a, a loud call, if you will. Also, وَإِذَا نَادَيْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ اتَّخَذُوهَا هُزُوَةً Another uh, ayah, similar meaning. إِذَا نَادَيْتُمْ If you call for the prayer. So yes, it is mentioned in the Qur'an. Now, of course, it is mentioned in the hadith much more extensively. It is also ijma' consensus. There's not a single Muslim scholar who said that adhan is not there or is not uh, recommended. Now, they don't say it is required as we're going to see. But they all say that it is part of Islam. It is part of Islam. Now, the Prophet mentioned adhan in several different ways. One time he was talking to one man who was living, he, he used to like to live in the desert, in the, like he was a Bedouin, or he, lo he loved to live in the open uh, you know, areas, in the open uh, land. So he told him, If you were in your area, in your open area, in the desert, by yourself, go ahead and make adhan and iqama. Because some people think there has to be like a, a gathering of people, there has to be like a city or a town or a village. It doesn't have to be. You can be by yourself and make adhan and iqama all you want. And that's what the Prophet told one of the companions. Also, when there were two people, he said to one of them, فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ أَحَدُكُمَا أَوْ أَكْبَرُكُمَا If you're two people, one of you should make adhan. So sometimes it could be one person, sometimes it could be two people, sometimes it could be a number of people. It is still something that we can do or we should do. What is the ruling though? It is really uh, an obligation, it is a must, or is it recommended? There are basically two opinions. One says it is highly recommended, sunnah mu'akkada, it is highly recommended, and the other opinion says it's fard kifaya. And we have to understand here the difference between fard ayn and fard kifaya. Fard ayn is a requirement on each and every individual. Fard kifaya is a, an obligation on the group, not the individuals. What does that mean? It means if any one of the group does it, then it suffices. But if no one does it, everybody has made, has committed a sin. So someone has to do it to relieve everybody else, if you will. So it is a fard on the group, not on the individual. And that's an important concept because it comes up a lot in fiqh. Fard ayn, fard kifaya. Fard on the individual versus fard on the group. So adhan is a good example of fard on the group because not everybody is supposed to make adhan. Only one person out of a group. So, for example, if you have a city uh, full of Muslims, only one or few will have to make adhan, and the rest, they just listen, but they don't have to make the adhan. So that's what it means. No doubt adhan is also a sha'ira. Sha'ira, uh, some people say sha'ira is barley, that's the common language, sha'ira, but sha'ira here it means a ritual. But it's not just any ritual, it's a visible ritual. That is sha'ira. In, in the Quran, it mentions sha'air. Or sha so uh, sha'air or sha'ira is a visible ritual. 
So Adhan is a visible ritual because you can hear it, people can hear it, and so forth. Okay. What about Iqama? Usually when we study Adhan, we study Iqama as well. Iqama, linguistically, it means Qiyam, to stand up. Why we call it Iqama? Because when Iqama is made, you have to stand up. Like you're waiting for Salat, somebody makes Iqama, what do you have to do? You have to stand up. That's why we call it Iqama, for that reason. Okay. Now, if we look at all the types of prayer, inshallah in the future, we're going to look at all kinds. You have a prayer for the eclipse of the sun. We have prayer for a drought. We have a prayer for taraweeh in Ramadan, right? We have prayer for Eid. We have prayer for Jum'ah. So many different types of prayer. So we're going to look at all types. But here when it comes to Adhan, prayers could be classified into three categories. The first category is where Adhan and Iqama are required. And that's only for the five daily prayers. The five daily prayers are the only ones that require Adhan and Iqama. The second type is where nothing is required. You don't require an Adhan and you do not require an Iqama. And that's for all of the Nafil, all the recommended prayers, all the sunnas you pray. None of it requires adhan or iqama. And then there is uh, some prayers where they fall in the middle. They require a special type of adhan. It's not the adhan we, you know, we're all familiar with, but it is a short sentence. You say, as-salatu jami'ah. That's a call. It is a call. It's not the long adhan. All you have to say is as salat jami'ah. And that is, uh, you know, uh, rec recommended in Salat al-Kusuf, in the eclipse prayer, as we're going to learn la later. And some people, some scholars, use it also for Salat al-Eid or for Salat, uh, you know, even uh, the drought and so forth. So that is a small adhan, if you will. Okay. The story of Adhan is interesting. Uh, Adhan was not, it did not come like a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one reason why scholars said this is not an obligation because if it was an obligation, it should have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. Rather, the Prophet was talking to his companions and he said, they all were saying, it's nice to have a way to call people to Adhan, to notify people, like how do we notify people? So it was like a consultation session. And one of them said, let's do the horn. And then they said, no, this is the Jewish way. And then other people said, let's use a bell. And they said, no, no, this is the Christian way. And other people proposing the fire and so forth. And nobody reached a conclusion until one of the companions, Abdullah bin Zaid, saw a dream because he was so keen to know how to call people to prayer. He was obsessed with it. So he saw a dream. In the dream, he saw the adhan that we know today. Somebody calling, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So he rushed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he told him what he saw. And what happened, it was a coincidence that other two companions saw the exact same dream. And they came to the Prophet reporting the same thing. And then the Prophet approved it. So it was an approval from the Prophet. It didn't, came, it didn't come from the Prophet himself either. And this is why we say it is a recommended sunnah. It's not an obligation. Because... It didn't come from the Qur'an or from the Sunnah directly. It was an approval. It is part of the Sunnah because it is an approval. But it did not come from the Prophet. It was not initiated by the Prophet himself. When the Prophet heard it though, he commanded Bilal to start making the Adhan because he had a better voice. And we're going to talk about that. That it is important to select some, someone with a good voice. Not some scary voice. I remember when I was a kid, there was this one mu'addin for Salat al-Fajr. Literally, you scare, get scared so much. Like, especially when you're asleep and you wake up with that voice. <laughs> so the idea is to select somebody with somewhat good voice. Okay. Let us see here. Now... 
When it comes to Adhan and Iqama, you're gonna see a lot of difference among the schools. And people get so confused sometimes. Like is it two Allahu Akbar, is it four Allahu Akbar in the beginning? Is it four Shahada, two Shahada? And people get so confused. So the first thing I wanna say that all the schools are relying on authentic sources. Because some people say, well, this way is bid'ah, or this way is not correct, or this way is not the sunnah. When it comes to adhan, all of the known methods are, you know, uh, you know, are found in the sunnah. So don't go to someone and say, this is not the right way. Unless they're doing it totally wrong. I mean, some people just mess it up completely. But I'm saying if you follow a known school, all of these people have evidence for it. For example, the Hanafis and the Hanbalis, they have 15 sentences for Adhan. 15 sentences. And they're following the way of the people of Kufa, which is part of Iraq. But then if you look at the Malikis, they have 17 sentences. And they follow the people of Medina. That's well known for Malikis. And then you have the Shafi'is. They have 19 sentences. And they follow the people of Mecca. Back then, like in the early days. So everybody was following a particular region. And how Muslims early on did Adhan. Because Adhan is, again, a visible ritual. So inshallah, I'm not going to take too long, but quickly, let's count 15. So can you help me count 15 here? This has to be a practice, a, an interactive practice. So how can we count? Let's start. For, first of all, let's do Adhan. So Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Each one of them is a sentence. So that is four so far. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Four shahadas. Okay, that is eight. And then hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala falah, hayya ala falah. So this is calling for salat and for success. That is four of them. We're twelve. And then at the end you say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 14, and then la ilaha illallah, that is 15. And that is the method of the Hanafis and the Hanbalis. What the uh, Malikis do, they add two shahada in silence. And this is why you get 17. So before saying ashadu an la ilaha illallah out loud, they say ashadu an la ilaha illallah. That's called tarjiyah. And that's one method that was taken from the Prophet. And before you say Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah, they say Ashadu Anna. So the Mu'addin doesn't say it out loud, but he say Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So if you see some Mu'addin, they stay silent for a little bit, they're not lost. They're saying Ashadu Anna, Ashadu Anna La ilaha illallah in silence before they say it out loud. The Shafi'i, they, they, they do four tarjiyah. Or rather, two more tarjiyah, more than the Maliki. That's why we have 19. So before saying, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, they say, Ashadu an la illallah, twice. And before, Ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, they say, Ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, twice in silence. That's why you get 19. So this is where, where you get all the counts. When it comes to iqama, the order of the Prophet is to make it, instead of two, make it one. So let's do, now do, uh, you have to divide by two to get the iqama. And then you're going to say, well, 15, how you divide 15 by 2? Or even 14, you get 7, but we have 11. The least you can have is 11, and we're going to see why. So instead of 4 Allahu Akbar, how many are we going to have? 2 Allahu Akbar. Instead of 4 Shahada, how many are you going to have? 2 Shahada. Again, we're, doing, uh, we're not doing the Hanafi way yet, because Hanafi is many more. So, so stay with me. So instead of 4 Shahada, we're going to do 2 Shahada. Instead of four hayya, we're going to say two hayya. But you're going to have to add qad qamat salat So that's going to add something. So it's not just taken away. You also have to add qad qamat salat How many times do you say qad qamat salat Twice. So again, two takbir, two shahada, two hayya, that's six. Two iqama, that's eight. And then you say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. You cannot uh, cut down Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, more than that. 
So you, you do say Allahu Akbar twice at the end, and then you say La ilaha illallah, that is exactly 11. All right? Now, <clears throat> the Malikis, they say it is 10, not 11. Why? Because they say even Qad Qamat al-Salat has to be once. So instead of saying Qad Qamat al-Salat twice, they say Qad Qamat al-Salat how many times? Once. So that is 10. And the Hanafis, I believe, if you count it correctly, I'll let it, I'll let it uh, be as a homework. They say it's 19. What you have to do for the, for the Hanafi, you don't cut it down by half at all. So it's like the Adhan, but you're adding Qad Qamat al-Salat, Qad Qamat al-Salat. Okay, so I'll let you figure it out. Quickly, what are some conditions of, uh, of Adhan? Number one, the entry of time. We mentioned that already. You cannot make Adhan before time. Number two, uh, but before that, there's an exception. So for Fajr, there are two Adhans, if you did not know. And the first Adhan can be done at night before dawn. But the purpose of that adhan is to notify people about the closeness of Fajr. Not the entry of Fajr, but that Fajr is near. And that's because usually people are asleep, so they need some prep time. So they need time to wake up and wake up and wake up. You know, it takes a long time, right? He's snoozing the alarm multiple times and all that stuff. Also to notify people who are praying that this now you, you need to, to, to leave some break before you pray Fajr, so you need to leave some break. Uh, also good for the people who are fasting, also to, to, know, to know that the time of real Fajr is getting close. So only for Fajr, you do two Adhan, and the first one is before the entry of dawn. But all the other times, all the other Adhans has to be after, or like at the, at the time or a little after. Okay. The second condition is that it has to be done correctly. Some people make mistakes when they say uh, the Adhan, like Allahu Akbar, like that. And I think the meaning of that Akbar is like uh, a drum. So you have to make sure that Allahu Akbar, not Akbar. And, and other, there are other mistakes. Uh, maybe one time I'll bring you some common mistakes in Adhan. So make sure that you, or the Mu'adhan has to make sure that they pronounce the, the Adhan correctly. Number three, it has to be consecutive. You cannot say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, take a break, go do something and come back in 15 minutes. So it has to be continuous. So these are the conditions of Adhan, they are very simple. The first one is the most important one. It has to be, uh, you know, it has to be at the beginning of time. And quickly, inshallah, we'll conclude with that. What are the conditions of the Mu'adhan himself? Number one, he has to be trustworthy. And that's obvious. The Prophet said, in المؤذن مؤتمن, That the Mu'adhan should be trustworthy. Because if he's not, he's going to make Adhan at his convenience. He could make it before time. Like he's in a hurry, he can't wait, and he'll do it before time. And that's not only for prayer. It's a problem for fasting too. What if he gives Adhan of Maghrib before time? and you break fast. What if he makes Adhan for Fajr, uh, you know, late, and you keep eating that suhoor, right? So he has to be trustworthy. The second one, he has to be, uh, he has to have a loud voice, sayyid. And today that's not needed anymore because we have the mic, the microphone. And number three, alim bil awqat. He has to know the times, and nowadays it's made much simpler. In the old days, it was not as easy to tell the beginning of time, especially for Dhuhr and Asr. These are a little tricky, inshallah, in the future we're going to talk about the times of each prayer, the beginning and the end. So that's going to be a whole session by itself. But all you have to know now is that the Mu'adhin, the, the uh, person making Adhan, they have to know the times. If you have a calendar, great. If you have a timetable, perfect. But they have to know, somehow they have to know the times. And nowadays you have the, the uh, Mu'adhin app, that's your virtual Mu'adhin, right? Uh, Islamic Finder, whatever, your favorite app, and it can make Adhan for you. I don't know if it satisfies all the conditions of the Mu'adhin, but 
uh, I think it does the job. So. I have a question. Yes. In the morning, the Zahir is saying, Salat al Khairun min al Nur. Correct. How that comes in? Yes, so in uh, Salat al Fajr, you also add, As Salat al Khairun min al Nur, twice. Uh, it says, a prayer is better than sleeping. So yes, it is added, you're right. So you could add it. But because it's not uh, in all the Adhan, we don't usually count it. But you're right, it is an addition only for Fajr prayer. Okay. I'm going to stop here, inshallah. I don't want to make it, I think it's, it's, it's got a little long. So I'll stop it here. If there's anything remaining, maybe I'll cover it next time. But I think this is pretty much all you have to know about Adhan. And I hope now you have a better understanding of Adhan. If there are any quick questions, inshallah, we can take it. Uh, is the food here yet? It's ready. it's ready. So maybe some quick questions. If not, we could. If you pray alone, you have to let Adhan. Okay, so we mentioned earlier there, were one, there was one incident. A man, Abu Sa'id, I believe, came to the Prophet and he, he said, You go back to your. He was a, like a Bedouin or living in al Badia, the open desert, he said, you can go back and make your own adhan and iqamah. That's fine. Again, it's not a must. It's a recommended sunnah. So you get more thawab, you get more reward if you do it. When do you stand for iqamah? Yeah, I mean, there's a difference of opinion. Some say you have to stand exactly when the, when the mu'adhan say, qad qamat as-salah. And some others say it doesn't really matter. As, as soon as you hear it, you can stand up in the beginning, in the middle. As long as you stand up, you're okay. I mean, don't, don't keep standing. Uh, don't keep sitting, rather. If you keep sitting, that's a problem. Like, people hear the whole iqamah and they keep sitting and they're waiting until the imam says, Allahu Akbar. Even when he says, Allahu Akbar, especially in taraweeh, you keep waiting and waiting and waiting until the imam is about to make ruku' And he, st he stood for what? 15 minutes? Half an hour? You wait until he's about to make ruku' and then you rush and make ruku'. That's not how we do it. So as long as you stand up during the iqamah or immediately after iqamah, you've basically satisfied the condition of iqamah. Yes. Yes. Uh, who is not required to make adhan? Again, it's not a requirement. It's highly uh, recommended. But for example, women, if it's only a group of women, they don't have to make any adhan or iqama. Um, some scholars say they can make iqama but no adhan. Also, uh, usually if it's only, uh, they say, the bo if, the, if a boy or if a child makes uh, adhan, it is accepted, but it's preferable for a, a, an adult to make it. Uh, and I have not seen a, a clear reason why, but some scholars mentioned that as well. Uh, so, in brief, uh, it is highly recommended, it is not a must, and it's mostly for, uh, you know, a group of men. Mm. Oh, okay. Do you have to have wudu to make adhan? Um, Adhan is a form of dhikr, and for all dhikr, it is highly recommended to have wudu, but it is not a must. Usually, you do it, you, you have wudu because, you know, you're going to make adhan, and then iqamah, and then you're going to pray. Unless you're going to make adhan, then break, go make wudu. So it's preferable that you do wudu first. But let's say if somebody made wudu, rather, he made adhan without wudu, we cannot say that the adhan is not acceptable. Because wudu is a condition for the prayer itself, not the adhan. Good questions. Any other questions? Is it true that uh, Bilal al used to pronounce his uh, sheen as a seen in his adhan? Or his as a sheen? There is a narration that the Prophet ﷺ even approved or liked his pronunciation that was a little different. But I need to investigate this, this a bit more. That he pronounced the scene as sheen and so forth, and he, he liked that even, for, because it came from Bilal. If it came from somebody else, maybe he, did, he would not have liked it, but from Bilal he accepted it. So there's a hadith to that effect, but let me look it up more, inshallah. Anything else? How about the age of like a child? 
Like we said, uh, for the, as far as age, if a child makes adhan, they say we can let it go, it's okay, it's no problem, but it's preferable if an adult makes it. But again, like I told the brother, um, I'm not fully aware of, of, of the evidence for that. Like, why do they say that? I'm not sure. But uh, I don't see, I mean, if, I mean, sometimes it's funny how certain scholars make requirements because we know that in the Sunnah, there were Imams who were as young as six and seven who led the prayer. Are you telling me that somebody is allowed to lead the prayer but he cannot make Adhan? And the reason they let them lead the prayer is because he memorized Quran more than anyone else. So of course the one who's going to lead, they have to know the, uh, the prayer, the conditions of the prayer. They have to know how to pray. They have to know the fiqh of the prayer like we're learning here. So if one of you, for example, learned the fiqh of the prayer really well, better than an adult, I would say he should lead the prayer. Because the condition for leading, as we're going to see later, primarily you have to understand how to pray. If you know that better than all the adults around you, I would, I would say you should lead the prayer. It's not about age, it's about how much you know. You know how to pray well. Because if there's an adult and they don't know what to do if they make a mistake in Salat. And you have a child who knows how to you know, react to something like that. Also, what about a child who memorizes Quran and reads Quran better than an adult? So for those, for those reasons, I say that Age should not matter. Wallahu alam. Go ahead. Yeah, let's say uh, you pray in Sunnah. Um, what do you have to do? So the question is if, uh, if I'm praying Sunnah and the Mu'addin makes the Iqama, the opinion I take is that you drop everything and you join the Imam. Unless you're about to finish, then go quickly finish and join the Imam. What is wrong is that you see some people, the, the, uh, you know, the imam is almost going to ruku or maybe even to sujood, and that guy is taking his time and praying this long, beautiful sunnah. That's not right. Because the, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, said that if there's a prayer in the masjid, the imam is praying, that's the only prayer. And some people might say, well, we have to pray sunnah before fajr. Yes, that is the normal way, normal case, but this is an exception. I know there are you know, a difference of opinion or there are some schools who stress that. Fine, I respect all the schools. But my, the opinion I take, if there is an imam praying, no one else should be praying something else, like a sunnah or a nafil or whatever. You come and join the imam. Yes. Good question. So the question is, if you are reading in Salat, you are reading, inshallah a lot of that will cover later, but this is, uh, let's take that question. If you are in Salat, and there is a surah that has a sajda in it, you know some surahs, they have sajda. So when you read it, you prostrate, you make sajda. So the question is, do I make sajda right away when I recite it in Salat, or do I wait until after Salat is done? And the answer is, you do it during Salat. By the way, Sujood at tilawa is highly recommended, it's not a must. Some people think it's a must. So let's say if an Imam skips it, that's fine. Because it's highly recommended, it's not a must. And some Imams, they warn the people before Salah, they say, in the second rak'ah there is a sajda after such and such. So now you know, because a lot of people make a mistake. He says, Allahu Akbar, and they go to ruku', and the Imam goes to sujood, and big confusion happens. You've seen those two, right? So, um, yes, it is okay to make sajda during Salat, sajda tilawa, or you can take the opinion that it is highly recommended, but you don't have to do it. In that case, you don't have to do it after Salat either, because it is, uh, you know, as sunnah, it is not uh, fard, it's not mandatory. Anything else? Yes. <clears throat> In some masajid, you find it common that when they make adhan, the 
nothing goes outside, even though they have microphones. So is it, a rec is it recommended to do it so you, uh, it is vocalized outside as opposed to inside? The question is, you see in some masajid, you, the, uh, the imam, uh, not the imam, the mu'adhin, they go outside and make adhan, or they open the door and make uh, the adhan outside, making sure that the adhan is heard outside. Is that a requirement? And the answer is no, uh, especially here in this land. Uh, the people who are hearing the adhan, they don't even pray, and they're not Muslim, most likely. So if there's a neighborhood where you have Muslims around you, I see the reason. Because adhan, adhan is for a reason. It's not like a worship that you don't understand uh, the illa, you don't understand the wisdom. Here we don't understand the wisdom. We just said the purpose of adhan is notification, i'lam. So here, who are we notifying? You're not, these people don't care about the adhan, they don't care the beginning of the or the beginning of asr. So I don't see a need for that. Uh, the microphone should be enough. Even now in Muslim countries, the microphone is enough. You don't have to go, like in the old days, you used to have to go on top of a building. This is why we have these long minarets. Now we put the microphone on the minaret, so it goes a long, long distance, right? <laughs> but the idea is to notify as many people as possible who are, who care about the prayer, people who care about the salat, people who are addressed, who are responsible for salat. If you remember last time when we talked about shurut al-wujub, who are the people who are required? We said Muslim, number one. You have to be a Muslim to be required to pray. So, like I said, I don't see a need for it. If people want to do it, it's up to them. But I don't see a need for the adhan to be called outside. Okay, any other questions? Ah, dead quiet, I like that. You guys probably tired. That's what it is. Yes? Pizza is here and it's getting cold, so please, people will... I have a question, uh, you know how you're talking about tafsir earlier? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, like, what if somebody asks you, like, about the historical integrity of the Quran, they'll be like, there's a story in the Quran, but there's, like, no archaeological evidence or something like that. So how do you explain that to them, like, that the Quran stories are um, perfectly correct? Okay, it's a good question, it's about tafsir. Some people say there are some stories in the Quran that may not have any archeological backing. So how do we, and they, they doubt the integrity of the Quran because of that. We have to, uh, you know, we have to see the difference between something that says that there is some evidence, some archeological evidence that the story in the Quran is incorrect versus not having enough evidence, because not having enough evidence doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that the story is incorrect or it lacks integrity. Only if you're able to prove 100% that there is an archaeological evidence that this story is incorrect, then we'll talk. Otherwise, it's your proof against my proof. You don't have evidence that the story is, is correct or in, integral or, or it, it, is, it has integrity, so what? Now, I think one of the common examples of that, that where integrity is questioned, questioned is the question of evolution. Because some people will come and say, and that's maybe the most common example of that. And that's where it could be problematic if we do not understand the Quran and what it says about the creation of Adam and all of that versus evolution. In my opinion, there's no contradiction to begin with. Like whatever science tells us today about evolution versus what the Quran tells us about Adam, there is no contradiction. But we have to understand what the Quran says and we have to understand what science says. Usually you have people who understand one but not the other. And this is a long topic. I don't think we can cover it now, but suffice to say that there is nothing in archaeology or in science in general that says that what is mentioned in the Quran as far as the creation of Adam is incorrect. But we have to understand the meaning of the creation of Adam and, and all the other creation as well. So maybe this is another topic. Maybe we'll talk about when we talk about Adam or something, we can talk about evolution in detail. But this is a short answer. Anything else? Okay, perfect.
I guess we're done then. Thank you. Zakum Allah khair. Subhanak Allahum wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat. Wa tawasaw bilhaqi tawasaw bil-sabr.